I always counsel physicians when they go online, there's always going to be a third of people who agree with everything that you say. There's a third of people who, no matter what you say, is going to disagree with what you say. Right. And then there's that third in the middle who are kind of persuadable to either side. And when I go online or when I advise physicians to go online, it's that middle third that you're really right. aiming to target. Dr. Jonathan Bakhtari. You can see it. I mean, it's crystal clear. I think it's going to really revolutionize things. Goes, which is a big game changer. Hi, welcome to another episode of uh, Bakhtari MD. And today I'm very fortunate and honored to have a guest, uh, Dr. Kevin Poe. He is a board certified internal medicine specialist, as well as the founder of Kevin MD. It's one of uh, social media's leading voices for healthcare. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, Dr. Poe has been in CNN and he's been on USA Today, where I know he's a contributor, and on many, many other uh, shows and uh, papers. Uh, Kevin MD, just to give you an idea, has 3 million monthly views. And I'll have him talk about some of the uh, articles that are published there. He's got over 250,000 followers on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and I thought we would bring him on to kind of go over a lot of what's going on in healthcare today, but also um, start off with learning a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Poe, Kevin, uh, thank you so much for coming on and joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Oh, thank you. So uh, as I was saying earlier, privately, we're going to turn the tables on you today. I, I know you've done it before, but uh, you're, you're, you have a daily podcast where you interview people seven days a week and where you uh, ask the questions and and find out about people's journey. And if you don't mind, I thought we kind of start off with you because you're not a typical physician. Uh, you're not a typical healthcare uh, person. So it would be interesting to see, um, you know, how you got through that journey. I know you did most of all your training in Boston, I think, if I'm right. And you finished uh, med school in 1999 and started residency in internal medicine and finished in 2002. So you were a new graduate. You, I, I remember what that was like, finishing internal medicine. And you said, okay, I'm going to go do primary care. And I know you started the journey that way. Um, and you can give us, you know, the shorter version if you want, however you much detail. But what happened after you graduated? You started seeing patients and you said? Yeah, so I started internal medicine, primary care. And I think it was because I really didn't know what else to do. I had interest everywhere. I would think maybe I can go into gastroenterology, maybe cardiology, but I didn't really... Um, I guess, like them enough to, to commit my entire life to it. And that left to kind of general practice. And really, I've been there for almost 20 years now, and I haven't really looked back. I really have a lot of gratitude and uh, for what I do. And it's really, I enjoy seeing patients um, every day. I think primary care certainly needs more physicians, and I'm very lucky to be doing what I do. So I have a primary care clinic in Nashua, New Hampshire, which is about 45 minutes north of Boston. I see patients three days a week. And a lot of people also know me as Kevin MD. I have a social media platform that I started back in 2004. And I'd be lying if I said that this was part of a, some type of grand plan. So <laughs> uh, to, to, you know, knowing what it is today, uh, I really didn't quite know exactly what I was getting myself into. Because if you think back to the early 2000s, social media was just in its infancy and the word blog was just starting to go come into our lexicon and in terms of physician bloggers i would say there were fewer than a hundred of that physicians online so i thought that it would be a nice way to really just share my thoughts and um, even back then there was a lot of confusion whenever new studies were published and new articles were published in the newspaper and I had a lot of questions from patients in the exam room asking me what I thought about whatever study came out or whatever drug got recalled and I started my blog at Kevin MD in 2004 and it um, I think that I published an article about a drug recall and I remember the next day I was talking to a patient and a patient read my article on Kevin MD and 
Wow. At that time, it was a, it was a revelation. And I think that was yeah. a proverbial yeah. light bulb moment where, you know, we can connect with patients uh, outside the exam room. And, uh, and yeah. that's when uh, we really, you know, started well, that journey. But so let me kind of, I, that's a great story. Uh, so how did it happen that, I mean, usually if somebody starts a blog and publishes one article, you know, without even SEO didn't exist back then, how did you actually get the word out for people to see it? Because uh, it's difficult now. I can imagine how difficult it was. How did you, uh, and also the second question is, were you the initially the only contributor? And at what point did you add other people? But I'll let you answer both of those. Well, I didn't have any SEO back then. It was just something on Blogger, right? Do we still use Blogger now? <laughs> back then, <laughs> yeah, I think so. And uh, it was uh, a simple blog where I would just share my thoughts. Um, I was the only contributor at that time. Um, to be honest, I don't know exactly how that patient found it, but he, uh, <laughs> but it, she did. So, uh, yeah. in the exam room, says, you know, I've been reading your blog. I was yeah, really yeah, curious yeah. about what you had to say. And there was that particular drug recall, and she was asking me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm I'm really comforted by what you had to say because of what uh, you wrote online. So, I think that's that, um, yeah. So I think it was really. So uh, when did you know it was going to like take off and 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 be even more than that? So so a lot of people have their personal blogs, but when did you say like, you know, this may be more than me just venting and mm -hmm. having a couple of patients? When did you kind of grasp on that it could grow more than that? probably a few years into it um at, at, at first i didn't realize that anyone really would read it maybe other than my mom you know right yeah. so i think <laughs> so i yes. think uh, <clears throat> a couple years in because i would have more and more patients um start commenting when i was yeah. seeing them in the exam room and then you have some mainstream media and i was a novelty yeah. at a time you know the blogging doctor right um but right. then <clears throat> i realized that it also could be a platform where other physicians who may not have platforms because not everyone is going to really take that time to start a blog or go on social media. So that's when I started inviting guest contributors. I'll probably say five to seven years in and mm -hmm. really uh, elevate their voices so they can be heard too, because a lot of I times see. physicians aren't often heard outside of the exam room. So this would right. be a great opportunity to utilize social media for them yeah. to do that. Right. Now, when, when you were doing these blogs, even back then, was it more to talk about topics that the public wanted to hear? Or was it initially more sort of, uh, you know, locker room kind of physicians, topics that other physicians would want to hear versus, in other words, who was your audience initially? And, and did that evolve? Was initially maybe your patients, maybe other doctors, other, or was it always meant to go to the general public? Yeah, it was an evolution. So I think at first it was really just to the general public because I think I was frustrated at the time where a lot of the medical articles, and that's still the case today, they weren't written necessarily by people who had a lot of a clinical background. Um, right. A lot of newspaper writers, they don't necessarily see patients in the exam room. And a lot of them, they don't have that background in, in the health sciences. So mm -hmm. I was kind of frustrated by that lack of a informed scientific take on a lot of the, the reporting that was done. So that's why I think I started the blog because, hey, I, I'm a physician and I have right. an, a more informed take on, on the current news. Yeah. And, I think that certainly evolved as more and more physicians are frustrated, certainly with our healthcare system right. and, um, you know, locker room talk maybe, but it's really just sharing stories that goes on mm. behind the exam right. room. And because a lot of the things that the, there are a lot of things that the public don't necessarily know what goes on behind closed doors in the exam room. And we talk about things like physician burnout. We talk about things like, um, all the regulations that physicians have to face and and the electronic medical record and how clumsy that is. And I think right. the reason why that's important and why patients need to know about it is because all of this stuff affects patient care. It affects how we care for patients. So the only way I think to make change with our politicians and those healthcare decision makers is by getting patients to care about them too. Because if 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 these things aren't rectified if our practice conditions aren't mm -hmm. improving the way we practice medicine are improving that's going to affect mm -hmm. the care that we give the patients yeah that's interesting you brought up electronic medical re records because that's a s interest of mine but i want to get back to that in a little bit but i just want to uh, just finish a little bit more on this story so um uh, as you invited other contributors, then I, I noticed uh, what year was it that you published your online reputation book and how did you take, you know, this blog and then understand that world and then decide to write a book about it? Sure. So 
I think if you look at a lot of studies, patients, of course, go online to research health conditions, right? And mm. I think uh, if you look at Pew Internet, it's like the third most popular reason why patients go online is to look for health information. But you know mm. what else patients are looking for? They're also looking for information about their doctors, right? Patients are right. Googling their doctors. And I think that really is synonymous with what goes on in other industries, right? You know, people are Googling right. their restaurants, their hotels, their, right, right. you know, airlines and, and, and books and right. all that. But now they're researching their doctors. And I think a lot of doctors are frustrated that whenever patients would Google their names, you know, what normally comes up, there are probably pages from these, you know, third party physician rating right. sites, right? These are right. sites that doctors really have no control over. And right. I, f I wanted to give doctors a way to really empower themselves so they can control their online reputation because mm -hmm. with social media, we don't necessarily need to hire a publicity firm for us to create an online persona. Doctors can do it themselves. We, we, we create websites, blogs, LinkedIn, Doximity. These are all things that doctors can do themselves so they can be more proactive in how they appear online. So I wrote that book in 2013, really sharing my journey up until that point. And really, it was more meant for a kind of a call to arms to inspire doctors right. and say, hey, yeah. we don't have to be um, subject to these third-party rating sites. We yeah. can use these tools to really define right. our own reputations online. Well, how did you get that uh, apprenticeship to to learn all that while you were, so you were practicing, uh, I assume maybe at the beginning you were also going to the hospital or is that not right? Because back that was then, way back then, right? So before yeah, hospitalists. Hospitals didn't exist. So you're in the office, you're going to the hospital, you know, you have CMEs and you have hospital meetings and got this blog going on. And then you say, oh, let me become a social media you know, whatever, not have that knowledge base and then pass that on. So how did you acquire that social media um, expertise? Well, early mornings and late nights, right? <laughs> so I think <laughs> I would go online um, to work on Kevin MD. Uh, at that time, I was working full time. And like you said, yeah. in the hospital. So you yeah, know, wake yeah. up at like 4.35 in the morning before yeah, going yeah. to clinic and getting the kids yeah. off of school and then late at night. And yeah. I think a lot of it is is something that you just learn yeah. on the fly because whatever you learn now isn't necessarily going to be relevant three to five years later because with right. social media and even now the online platforms everything is just changing on a monthly basis right and right. so i took a lot of my experience growing the blog and dabbling ah. into twitter and facebook and realizing that hey these are sites that get ranked high on google when your name is googled and a lot of it is this kind of practical on the job training um, so to speak. So there's no real courses. I didn't really take, you know, any type of, of coaching. This is a, um, uh, at 2013, uh, yeah, I've been yeah. on social media for like eight to nine years and it was as a culmination <laughs> oh of what I've learned then. And I know that, and even now a lot of doctors, they just don't have the time interests or really the resources yeah. for them to learn this because it, this yeah. is a, building an online platform and, and, uh, creating and, controlling establishing your right. online reputation isn't necessarily something that's taught in medical school and no. residency so you were very early to it what kind of response did you get from the book i mean we're back in 2013 when doctors i don't know if back then if doctors saw that like okay whatever and you know um a lot of sort of pessimism i hear from other doctors is you know only the patients that you know i that are complaining because i didn't give them narcotics or you know, or, or whatever, they go online and they write these reviews and, you know, so they kind of almost throw up their arms and say, you know, what, what are we going to do? Did you get that kind of blowback that I get from a lot of physicians? Like, you know, the, the, not, it just seemed like they, they thought as a realm that they couldn't control it. Also, I think for some physicians, and maybe I'm speculating, but you tell me your experience, they felt like it was above them back then, you mm -hmm. know, like, you know, I, you know, I'm a professional. I'm, I'm not going to be like a, like a restaurant trying to get people to come to my restaurant. So yeah, did you get any kind of responses like that or maybe other responses? Yeah, so there's obviously a spectrum of responses. So there are people who definitely, um, you know, whatever I said resonated with them and it really, hmm. um, you know, they had their own light bulb moment when I told my story and they realized how important being online is. And of course, on the other end of the spectrum, there is this indifference. Uh, like you said, there is obviously physicians who, even listening to what I say and reading my book, they'll say, you know, I don't have time for social media. 
why should I care? I have enough patience and I just don't want to go online. And, and that's perfectly fine because my job isn't necessarily to convince every single person I talk to, to really, you know, jump on Facebook mm-hmm. and start a blog. Mm-hmm. That's certainly not my goal at all, but mm-hmm. it's really just to get physicians to realize that if they're not online, um, you know, I think that there's a whole plethora of reasons why they should mm-hmm. be. And I'm sure we'll talk about things like mm-hmm. online misinformation and online reputation and getting their mm-hmm. voices heard. And And I think that when I share my journey and I give my big three reasons why physicians should go online, it does resonate with a proportion of the clinician audience, but certainly not all of them. And I certainly, especially in this day and age, it's very difficult to convince everybody right. that you talk to, right? Right, right. When you were writing your blogs, just to kind of go back to that real briefly, did you also do, hey, this is what goes on behind the scenes or was it pretty much reviewing your articles? Because I know your current blogs where people talk about their journey goes into that. But but originally, was that meant to also let the patients have a window to what it's like to see 20 patients a day and be in the moment for all 20 of them, you know, which I always espouse like being no matter what even if you're saying 5 10 15 patients a day yeah. things like locker room kind of stuff that uh that i i think patients really do want to know or would be fascinated with yeah so at first um yes it was uh sharing my stories my frustrations and some of the difficulties that i face in giving patients the care they deserve and one of the things that that's led me to of course was having mainstream media take note of some of the things that I wrote about. So I had the opportunity from my writings on my blog, I caught the attention of USA Today, where they invited me to write um, opinion pieces on their newspaper. And I will talk, of course, about things that a lot of doctors were frustrated with, and that's common knowledge amongst other doctors. And back then, you know, we talk about things like, you know, burnout and clumsy electronic medical records and, and, uh, and, and, you know, anything to do with health policy. But I was able to use that mainstream media platform really to share from a physician's perspective, which I think is tremendously important because in newspapers, whenever people talk about health policy and health care, I always say they're, they're, they're not necessarily written by clinicians who are in the proverbial trenches, who see patients every day. They're, they're, they're writing from the perspective of, of, you know, perhaps in the ivory tower or, or right. in an academic setting where they don't necessarily see patients on a daily basis. And I thought it's important to have that perspective from a practicing physician because a lot right. of doctors, they're too busy to simply seeing patients or mm-hmm. they're in the, in the hospital and they don't have time to write op-eds and, and it's very difficult to have their practice improve. So, so that, that was one of the opportunities that I'm certainly most grateful for is c- catching the attention of mainstream media and, being able to really um, speak from a larger platform. Yeah, I think you hit on something, which is on some level, it's sort of um, the inverse of what it should be. The people who should have the loudest voice are the people who sh- are seeing the most patients on, on some level, yet the people who, who uh, have the time to be you know, more administrators or policymakers are the ones that are often seeing the least number of patients mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of makes sense, you know, if, if, if you want to, you know, if you want to know about plumbing, you, you want to get a plumber that's like fixing drains, tw- you know, 10 hours a day, mm-hmm. not someone who used to fix drains 20 years ago and now is pontificating and especially understanding what patients go through, because unless you're seeing 10, 15 patients, 20 patients a day, yeah, it's hard. Sometimes you can get lost and is, is that a another way of saying what you were saying or do you want to add anything to that no i think you, you hit the nail on the head right the people who um who make health policy um they don't necessarily see patients yet their decisions affects the people who do see patients so mm-hmm. i think it's better now certainly than it was 10 to 15 years ago i think um, it's so easy to have a platform and now we have a lot of people who've written this, an article on kevin md and they themselves get noticed right. by television stations and and radio stations and they they use that kevin md platforms to vault themselves into mainstream media so they can uh, share their voices and stories so i think that um it's been a powerful tool and it's been so gratifying and rewarding to see that evolution over the years 
Yeah, thank you for doing that because uh, as you're saying that, I mean, your platform, uh, hopefully with others, has allowed some of that disconnect to come become less as you're suggesting. So thank you. Um, and that's a really good segue. So if people don't know about Kevin MD as a platform, I know I tried to summarize it, but uh, love to hear the full blown version of what your platform is and what it can do and all the bells and whistles of it, if you don't mind. Kevin MD is a platform where my mission is to share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system, but are rarely heard from. And it comprises of various um, um, entities. So you have kevinmd.com, which is my main site where I have thousands of healthcare contributors share any type of story tangentially related to healthcare. And I've learned so much just from reading their stories and experiences. I also have a podcast, the podcast by Kevin MD, which is the only daily medical podcast where I have Kevin MD authors on the show, sharing their stories in their own words. And like I said, my job is very easy. I just sit back and ask questions and just listen and learn what they had to say. And we're up to almost 600 episodes doing this for almost two years now. That's and then amazing. I always like to share my story um, from the speaking stage. So uh, before COVID, I had the opportunity to go to various uh, conferences where really a lot of physicians would wonder, you know, why is social media so important? So just like I'm doing with you, I share my story and, and really uh, try to convince some doctors, not necessarily to jump on social media, but at least get them thinking about why it's so important. And being a speaker, I've uh, realized that physicians, um, you know, the level of physician speaking certainly can be improved. So um, I, I do some coaching on a side where I talk to physicians about how they could improve their stage presence and keynote speaking ability. And I have a small physician speakers bureau where there's 10 of us who are physicians and, and they're all wonderful speakers where I can use some of my contacts from some of the old events to, mm -hmm. if they're looking for future physician speakers, they could come to my bureau where they'll um, peruse vetted experience practicing physicians who are fantastic on stage. So in a nutshell, that's, that's really the Kevin MD platform, but really it's, it, it, it's a way where we can, where I can, um, uh, just use my experience in social media really to elevate clinician voices so they can be heard and make a difference. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, so not only are you doing it, but you know, you're, you're, uh, uh, kevinmd.com allows people to put their experiences their blogs from just nurses or anybody in healthcare that like you said normally wouldn't get a voice so that's really a unique perspective you know i think a lot of people think about oh i got to get my voice out but it's rare that someone says i need to get my voice out as well as bring my colleagues with me so we can really you know bring attention to what we're going through on a daily basis especially for those who are seeing patients on a daily basis. So thank you for that. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of touch back more about your clinical evolution. So I know we've covered uh, the social media and some of that other stuff, but clinically, was it hard? When did you give up hospital work? And let's just with that alone, was that hard? Was, was Did you feel like uh, you're, you're sending off one kid to college and keeping one kid? Or uh, how did you deal with that when, when that finally happened? So, like I said, yeah, like you said, when we f first started out, you, I had to, you know, my primary care clinic, and we would round in a hospital, and then there was also the nursing homes as well, right? So I yeah, thought that right. was very difficult. But you know what? Coming out of residency, you just didn't know any better because <laughs> because uh, any situation would have been better than than what. I dealt with residency, right? So coming with the first job, <laughs> I didn't really push back or argue. I said, Hey, this is what it is. And it was as, as difficult as it is, as I think about it now, it was much easier than residency. So I just yes, gladly accepted that is true. What, what they gave you. So, um, so I think just like a lot of clinics and you had the progression of the hospitalist movement, um, I'll probably, you know, five to seven years into my my job then we, you know, we had a hospitalist program at right. our institution that took um, over inpatients and then do you have uh, a physician who just rounds on a nursing homes so that, that took, a, right. took that off our place so now I, I see patients in the outpatient setting 100 percent of the time and as right. you know there's pros and cons to that because from a, yeah. sort of a lifestyle standpoint it makes it much easier you don't have to go back and forth and yeah. if you're raising a family and like you mentioned I have two young daughters 
well, they're not so young anymore, but one's in junior <laughs> high school, one's in middle school. Uh, okay. It was it was much easier um, to do just outpatient um, clinic right. versus going to three different places. But of course, no. you have um, some of the downsides of that, which is that lack of continuity. And it's better now, but when the hospitalist program was just implemented, there were problems in terms of communicating back and forth with the hospitalists. And you had to yeah. explain to patients that when they got admitted to hospital, you weren't necessarily going to go in and see them. Right. So, right, right. so that took a little bit of a transition, but that was yeah. you know, at least over a decade ago. And now it's pretty much everywhere where <laughs> right. you have hospitalists and patients have that expectation now that, Hey, when they go to the hospital, you don't necessarily see them. And yeah. I think there's been such a focus on continuity of care that, we do have right now pretty good communication with our hospitals, but it's see, been certainly interesting to see that evolution from when I first started out back in like 2002, yeah. fresh out of residency to what the healthcare situation is now. Yeah. For people who don't know what a hospital is, uh, it's cause I actually covered this on, on a, on a video. So I'll put a link to that, but I went over th the pros and cons of that and that video and some of the, some of the pros and cons you, you mentioned too. I think for me, uh, uh, maybe I'm uh, slightly different. Uh, you know, I, I think what, what I noticed is, uh, that, um, you know, hospitals have a certain mindset that, because they're interchangeable and your primary care usually hopefully isn't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're like, you're getting your outpatient care from someone you have rapport with and, but your inpatient care is theoretically possible. You'll get the same hospitals on two admission, but probably not. And I think what I've noticed is that lack of continuity from hospital stay to hospital stay is lost versus the primary care. Hopefully isn't you know you're seeing the same one and so i've seen some patients struggle with the fact that oh, who's this new person do they mm -hmm. know me and uh do i have to go through the whole thing all over again and uh do you do your patients give you blowback about you know oh every hospital stay and even the, the hospitals have days off so it's another hospitalist and are, are you getting any blowback for that lack of continuity when your patients get readmitted and they come to, back to your clinic and like I had this other guy now I had this guy and uh, I don't think that guy understood what this guy was do you see any of that or is that just me well one thing I like to think is that my hospitals don't go to the hospital my patients don't go to the hospital that often where they yeah, have okay. to <laughs> realize again, yeah. that they see different hospitals each time but I yeah. think um the, the patients who do go to the hospital a lot and you know, there is a certain frustration in terms of seeing someone different and it could be within even the same stay, right? If, uh, right. If, if, you know, those hospital shifts go from like seven days on seven days off. So right. if you catch a doctor at the end of their seven days, they may get someone new in the, in, in right. the hospital. So yeah, I, I do get that complaint sometimes. I, like I said, less so now, just because I think just patients they're, they're they've grown accustomed to it now. So at first when we had this new, you know, back then system in place, there was a significant mm -hmm. amount of pushback and complaints. But I think that um, as we've fine tuned um, the mm -hmm. system, and I think from the hospital standpoint, they've certainly done a better job in terms of managing expectations and better communicating with patients and making them realize that, hey, you know, I may not be the doctor to see you tomorrow. It's all about really communication and, and managing their expectations. And we still have room, of course, to, to, to work on that. But I think that if you do communicate appropriately with patients you, you're going to have right. less of that blowback no i hear you especially as you said maybe it's gotten better because also technologies the medical record system where you get some of those hospital stays somehow flowing into your system so you can have that so i think technology is contributing that to be even better you know so i think two you know i mean i i i started it maybe a decade before you in terms of getting out and uh, um, but I think both you and I have had this evolution of the hospitals thing, kind of totally changing everything. The other th evolution that's occurred while we've been on the watch is, uh, this, uh, the whole idea of mid levels and nurse practitioners and PAs. I'm sure, you know, what you see today is nothing like 2002, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, pretty much if you go to an ER now, uh, or, or even go to a new primary care office, more than likely you're going to be greeted by a nurse practitioner or a PA, and that's increasing mm -hmm. by the week, the likelihood. Any ER, any urgent care, uh, you know, this whole idea I'm going to the ER to see a doctor, uh, 
is probably you know often not the case although they may talk to a doctor or whatever um tell me about that evolution for you and your patients first of all do you have uh, mid levels in your clinic and you know nurse practitioners pas and how, how has that changed the patient experience to having now a a layer sometimes between them and maybe their physician yeah so uh, we have wonderful advanced practice practitioners in my clinic and we have um I think four or five um, nurse practitioners and physician assistants, and they're all uniformly excellent. And they work within the constructs of our team. I feel very comfortable sending my patients to them and they don't hesitate to, to if they have questions about any type of patient care, they, they don't hesitate to, to come to me with any questions. So right. we have that great communication. And you're right, I think pretty much every field, whether we're talking about emergency medicine and surgery and and hospital care, you have advanced practice practitioners um, out there simply because there just aren't enough doctors, right? Especially in primary care. Like it's very difficult to mm-hmm. recruit a primary care physician into a non-metropolitan, non-academic center area. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of systems, they simply have no choice but to hire advanced practice practitioners. So they've uh, there's certainly been a proliferation um, over the last... 10 to 20 years, especially, Mm -hmm. um, you know, since I first started, but uh, working within a team approach, um, I think that it it, it definitely does help in seeing the volume of patients that need to be seen. Um, Like I said, I'm only in the clinic two and a half, three days a week, and I have over 3000 patients, right? So if you can't come see me, they're going to see my nurse practitioner or physician assistant. Uh And do you have a close pool, by the way, I I didn't mean to interrupt, but do do you have a close pool where, where, you know, you have a limited number of patients and that's it. Yeah. So I, I, eventually there's going to be a ceiling, but, uh, again, uh, I work for a hospital based, uh, system. So that's, uh, those decisions are above my pay grade. Right. Okay. And, um, so like I said, I, I have wonderful, um, yeah. teammates and colleagues that I work with. So if they can't yeah. see me there, the patients know that if yeah. they see one of my advanced practice practitioners, then that information gets relayed to me. And the vast majority of my patients have zero issue with that. Perfect. You know, the other thing I noticed about you, which I brought up offline too, was that you've had the same clinical job your whole career. And I, and I know part of that is uh, you have all these outside interests, but what's a, what I know you and I very rarely find someone who's had one clinical job, maybe there are some, but rare. Uh, what does that say about you? And, I, and and what would you advise people like, you know, starting out saying, hey, I, I'm going to try to find one job and, and kind of make it work as opposed to every few years, you know, moving sure. on to something else? Yeah. So there's a couple of things to that. So number one is, of course, luck, right? Because coming out of residency, I didn't know what to look for in a job. But, you know, certainly I don't know what I know now. And I talk to you know, thousands of doctors in terms of their job situation. So if I were looking for a new job now, it would be a much different experience than what it was when I first came out of residency. So there was a lot of luck involved in that. I lucked into a practice with good people and really like everything. It's really about the people. It doesn't matter. Well, of course, the organization matters, but what matters so much more is the people that you're around with. And I have nothing but great things to say about the really family-like atmosphere that I lucked into uh, in I, the clinic. So especially coming out of residency, not really knowing anything, they you know, kind of took care of me, showed me the ropes, and and really was an easy transition to me so for me. So the, the number one is just luck. And number two is, of course, personality. I'm the type of person who likes to stick with things, right? And, and persevere through things. And that's evident with, of course, Kevin MD. It's like being on social media and running a platform for almost, you know, almost 20 years now. It right. takes a certain type of uh, personality. Um, yeah. Doing six, almost 600 straight days of podcasts without missing a day, <laughs> that takes a certain amount of personality. So I think there's also a personality trait where I do yeah. like to stick with things longer than most. Yeah, well, and that's showing up in your brilliant work because I think we all know that you know to do something amazing, yes, it takes talent, uh, and it uh, you know you just may be whatever in the right place, but if you don't have the perseverance and dedication and the long hours and working weekends and nights and what have you to to make it happen so um which actually just want to transition to one thing that i always talk to other physicians I, you know when i 
talk to physicians who are even close to burnout or to any level of frustration, one of the things I commonly hear is, what else can I do? I'm a mm -hmm. GI doctor. What else can I do? You know, it's so interesting. I give this... I, I give this coaching thing to some physicians who come to me who are burnt out and they're like, well, what else can I do? And mm -hmm. I always say, if you were smart enough to get into medical school, if you mm -hmm. were smart enough to get an A in organic chemistry, if you were smart enough to get an A in physics, if you were smart enough to pass the MCATs and then you, you pass two years of med school in terms of classroom stuff, and then you got your, your boards and what have you, you're not smart enough to figure out something else to do whether on the side or as a replacement, it always amazes me. Physicians, by and large, are you know in terms of their education and their level of brightness, should be on the upper scale of things. I've never met a group of people who are so brilliant, so smart, but feel like they're stuck and they can't mm -hmm. do something else. So I always say, if you're smart enough to get into medical school, shouldn't you be smart enough that if you're frustrated, you should at least have other channels like you did, which is... You know, so in other words, when they close the chapter on your book, on your career book, why does it, when they close that book, why does there have to be only one chapter? Mm -hmm. Why can't there be three? Mm -hmm. Why can't they say, oh, Dr. Poe, he was a great primary care doctor. The patients loved him. He was amazing. Oh, Dr. Poe, he had a platform. Why, why, is, there, why is there only one chapter mm -hmm. for most physicians' life? Why can't there be two or three or four? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. So number one, you're right. A lot of physicians, of course, they have to ace organic chemistry and physics and all their preclinical years. But I think the path for a lot of physicians is very linear, right? So you go to pre-medical studies and then you go to medical school, then you do, you know, whatever, three to seven years of residency, some do a fellowship, and then you're, uh, you're, you're an attending. So that's almost 20 years of your life going down a linear path. And right. when you're in that linear path, it's just so difficult you don't have time for everything else. And that's really all you know how to do. And that's a common theme I talk to a lot of, uh, with a lot of physicians who are burnt out when they say, I don't know what else to do is because they've been doing the same thing for 20 years. It's like talking to like a professional football player and after they retire and then you ask them, you know, what else are they going to do? And they just don't know because they literally have been playing football for like the past 20 years of their life, 24 seven. And I uh -huh. think it's the same for our physicians as well. We're just doing medicine 24 seven for 20 years. So if you ask uh -huh. us what else is there to do, we're probably not going to have a good answer for that. Right. So I'm glad that you brought up physician burnout because that's, that is a topic that, comes on very, very frequently on my podcast and blog. And uh -huh. I'm sure you and your audience yeah. knows the numbers about how almost 50% of physicians experience symptoms of burnout. And I'm right. sure that number is only going to rise during the pandemic. Right. So the question then becomes, why are physicians burning out really? And a lot of people give reasons, um, but I think really what it comes down to is physicians are really losing their autonomy right? We go through that 20 years of training 24 seven, living, breathing and sleeping medicine. And you go out to practice and we feel that a lot of the tools that we have to take care of patients are taken away from us. You know, we're forced to hmm. fill out all this paperwork. We're forced to see X amount of patients per day. We're forced to use mm -hmm. clunky electronic medical records that take twice as long to write notes, right? And mm -hmm. I think a lot of that autonomy is taken away from us. And that leads to a lot of uh, what's called moral injury for among physicians that we can't mm -hmm. give patients the care they deserve because we just don't have the tools and we're just unable to do so. And mm -hmm. that leads to a lot of physicians just leaving clinical medicine altogether. And I've talked to hundreds of doctors who are in that bowl where they just leave clinical medicine and that really doesn't do patients any good. What good is a doctor if they, they leave clinical medicine, right? So, so that's one of the things that I do explore on my own podcast and on my site. And, mm -hmm. and to answer your initial question, you know, what else can we do other than medicine? Of course, to you and I, the answer is easy. There's plenty of that, that, that doctors can do because one of the, the themes that I always like to pound on is that doctors or clinicians, we're more than our degrees. We're more mm -hmm. than just people who can see people in the exam room mm -hmm. or in the hospital in the operating room. I've talked to physicians who've done so many things. You know, they, they, they buy real estate. They, um, they, they manage properties. They go into non-clinical jobs, whether it's pharma, whether it's um, working for insurance companies, right. work at expert witnesses. They work as right. investment managers. They work as coaches. There right. are literally hundreds of things that physicians can do with right. their degrees other than seeing 
um, yeah. you know, seeing patients. And I think one of the keys that these doctors, or whenever you talk to a doctor who says, what else can I do, is really surround themselves with like-minded people. You know, Because right. I can guarantee you, a lot of physicians, they're going to be in the same boat. They're thinking about stepping away from medicine or right. going back to full time and, and having another source of income. So they're not so financially right. dependent on their right. medical job and um, they can do other things. You got to surround yourself with like-minded people by listening to podcasts like this. Um, there right. are, are dozens of Facebook groups that you could look for where oh. you have a physician's um, in similar boats, you know, um, if you just wow. Google say, or go on Facebook and search for physician side gigs, that's a group by my friend Nisha Mehta. She was a okay. radiologist and that's a group of almost, I don't know the exact number, between 50 and 60,000 verified physicians. And it's literally called physician side gigs oh. where doctors explore what else they can do outside of clinical medicine. So that's, that's amazing. one area that, that I would start and, and if you just, um, and then if you don't know where else, you can certainly hire a physician coach. There are plenty of physician coaches that. I, and what would be a podcast. good resource for that for the audience to to go to to any place on your site or where else? Yeah, so where if is you go, just go to my site and just look under physician coach, and I've had a lot of physician coaches write articles on my site about this mm -hmm. exact question: What else can they do outside of clinical medicine? Right. So I go on kevinmd.com and search for physician coaching or physician coaches and. They're able to look up those articles. Um, yeah, I have so many, so I don't want to necessarily recommend one over the other. But mm -hmm. talking to a, a physician who understands what you're going through and understands right. some of the, the guilt and the obstacles to finding right. something outside of clinical medicine and finding your passion, I think it's absolutely critical to managing burnout because the last thing that we want is for physicians to leave clinical medicine entirely. If anything, maybe back down like I did a few days. So you're still involved with clinical medicine, but you have another passion that fills your cup because we don't want any physician to be so burnt out that they leave the field yeah. entirely because right. that isn't going to do patients any good. Yeah, those are amazing resources. Uh, I'll try to make sure we put some links for people even here to your to your site to find those coaches and that Facebook page. That's, thank you for sharing that. I, I, you know, we try to do these podcasts so we can help people and what you just related is amazing information. Uh, can I ask you one, one psychological thing that I've noticed with physicians? Uh, and that is, you know, I, I know you said they can like do it part time, but if physicians have an opportunity to do something that involves giving up clinical full time, I find that certain physicians struggle with the absolute walking away from it. Yeah. Part of it, it has to do, you know, you're, it's sort of like investing in something for 20 years and then mm -hmm. saying, ah, you know, you build up a restaurant for 12, I'm just going to close it. But I think there's also this idea of who they are. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're a physician, but you don't see patients and people bump into you, your relatives, well, are you, pra and you're not, well, no, I'm not really practicing. I'm doing some, one of the things you said, I'm doing investments or I'm doing that. Um, I think it's, Physicians, I think maybe more than many other uh, professions, the, the, your self-identity, who you are, is so tied into seeing sure. patients that uh, even when a great opportunity comes up, and I've seen you know friends of mine call me and say, I've got this opportunity to, you know, this pharma company wants me to get involved, but I can't, I can't give up seeing patients. And by the way, and maybe they shouldn't, I mean, depending on where they are. Sure. But do you, is there something almost embryonic about seeing patients to physician psyche. Uh, have you seen that? And, and what do you think of what I'm saying? So there's always a question I ask whenever people ask me that question. It's this, when you die, and I'll take it too morbid, but when you die and on your gravestone, you want to be able to answer this question. Do you want to be remembered for who you are or what you do? Right? So if you are a physician all the time. And if your passion is seeing patients 100% of the time, more power to you. And if you want to be remembered as a great physician, that's who you are. And there are a subset of physicians who fall in that category and more power to them because that's certainly not everybody. But there are a lot of physicians who see patients and they're not necessarily there for their families. They're not necessarily there to be at their kids' most important events because they're in the hospital all the time. And those doctors need to ask themselves, 
how do I want to be remembered after I die? Am I going to be remembered for, for what I do or who I am? One thing I always say is that medicine is always going to be there for you, but my kids are only going to be young ones, right? right. So when after my kids grow up, you can always go back to medicine. So when you talk about that physician identity, uh, being intertwined with seeing patients all the time, you know, I certainly think that used to be the case. But I think now, like I said before, doctors are so much more than their degrees. Uh, there are fantastic doctors making a difference on social media, like I am. Right. There are doctors making a difference on a non-clinical job, being an expert witness. I think that there are so many ways where we can help patients, where it's not necessarily so narrowly defined as it used to be. Right. I think I've made a difference to patients who read my site during the pandemic, helping to right. clear up misinformation, helping patients um, overcome their hesitancy towards the vaccine. So right. I think that we need to get away from that single-mindedness where a doctor equals seeing patients, because I think now there are just so many other ways where we can use our degrees to help patients. Right. That's not necessarily in the exam room. No, I, I think you just um, did the trailer for this podcast. That was excellent. I, I think this whole thing of, you know, your kids and family and balancing and, and doing, you know, multiple things that are important to you later on and now i think that really hits the nail on the head i think a lot of physicians let 20 years roll by of you know working seven days a week and then say oh well, you know what just happened and you know did i spend enough time with family and kids and and even outside interests or exercise or whatever else that keeps them going it's uh, the old adage when you're saying yes to something you're saying no to something else mm -hmm. you know this when you juxtapose you know that it, it, the, there's more clarity as opposed to I, part of it. You know, I always used to use this analogy, like when you first get that acceptance letter to medical school, right? I, I sort of have the analogy I give is, I don't know if you've ever been in Europe where they have these express trains that mm -hmm. like literally will bypass five countries and get you from here to there and you can't stop in the middle, right? And no matter what, I mean, you you're done. I mean, you're, you're in this part of Europe, you're going to end up and there's no other stops and it's an express train. So it's like when you, when you get into medical school, it's like, that is the ticket for the express train. You know, some people view it, okay, I'm getting into medical school here and I'm getting off when I'm 60 something and I'm retiring and there is no stops in the middle. There's no diversions. There's no sidetrack. So, you know, I, I kind of, it's a similar way of saying what you're saying, which is it's this express train and and people sometimes, I the physicians that want to do it, I want to give them courage to say, it's okay. You know what? Mm -hmm. Tell them to stop the train and get off or take a breather or take a side tour and come back. But this like, no, nothing. I can't even take a month off. I can't go to my partners and say, look, I need three months. I just want to kind of circle around and I'll be back. It will, you know, what will they do? What will they say? So I think how do we get physicians to say it's okay mm -hmm. to pause the express train and get your bearings? Any th I mean, any thought on that? Yeah, I think one of the, the ways, um, in addition to what we already described in terms of finding your passion outside clinical medicine on a more practical basis is that you have to be financially independent from medicine, meaning that if you have mm -hmm. debt and you're relying on um, your income mm -hmm. from your physician job, then it is very difficult to, to walk away. It's very difficult to cut back because if you're relying on that income to, you know, pay for a mortgage, to pay for an expensive car, to pay for all the, you know, the, the proverbial doctor lifestyle, right? And right. you need that, that um, your physician job, then it's difficult to walk away. So the solution to that, that I talked to a lot of doctors and that they do is that you need additional sources of income. So it's very, right. you know, you need sources of, of income. Um, you know, what we call it outside our W2 income, right? So we need right. our um, income, you know, whether for the vast majority of physicians, it's real estate. So I have a lot of doctors who take courses, online courses on how to buy and manage properties. You know, there's syndications, which is passive source of income. Basically they need right. other income streams to supplement their clinician ah. income. So, they are financially independent from medicine. So they are able to cut back. So if you, you know, take myself, for instance, you know, I think pri practicing primary care five days a week is very, very difficult. And um, I, I, I really salute the primary care doctors who see 30 patients a day, five days a week, because that for me would be a sure path to burnout. But I'm able to 
um, become financially independent from my physician job where I am able to only work at 0.5 FTE, which right. is like full-time equivalent, like basically working part-time. And I can supplement my income by by speaking and um, by running a platform, by doing my podcast and doing things outside of clinical medicine. Right. So, um, yeah. and, and in a way, I think that's kept me going because I've had so many doctors where they are, where they see patients five days a week and they've left medicine entirely. But I'm still here after what mm-hmm. almost 20 years seeing patients three days a week. And like you said, at the same job for almost 20 years. And yeah. I think part of that ironically is cutting back. So by cutting back, right. you can last longer. And I think that's a lesson that a lot of physicians can learn from. Yeah. I, you know, the, I think what we just talked about, what you just said is the big elephant in the room that, you know, we don't really talk about, which is like you said, these physicians, go into their career, they become a GI doctor, a cardiologist, they buy the cardiologist house and they buy the GI house and the mortgage and the car and you know the, the the private schools and and then and so their decision to you know what they do on that express train is is really colored by that need to maintain that lifestyle. And uh, if you can supplement that income as you're saying and eventually maybe replace it, then then when you're saying yes to clinical it's basically just out of love and not out of, I got to maintain this lifestyle. I hope physicians hear that loud and clear, especially younger physicians who are just starting out because it, if they plan early and say, you know, I may stick with it, I may not, but it'll be a choice and not I have to. So that that's great. I want to kind of uh, finish up a little bit um, talking about uh, what you alluded to and what's an area of you know expertise for me is the covid era and how that has impacted medicine uh obviously more telemedicine and the, all that other stuff but from where you sit this pandemic and how it's changed your practice how you view medicine how you view healthcare what your guests on your podcast their perception i was listening to one of your podcasts where a physician was talking about their burnout during covid you know where they were very depressed and you know what have you. And I thought that was very interesting. Tell me more about your, you know, kind of global view. It's not in the rear view mirror by any stretch of the imagination, but looking at a little retrospectively this last year and a half, what, what, what do you make of it and how's it impacted healthcare? So one thing I like to say is that, of course, we have a pandemic of COVID, but we have an epidemic of misinformation brought up by COVID. Mm-hmm. And I think that COVID has really brought to, brought to the forefront the misinformation epidemic that's actually been going on for for years i've been talking about this on on the stage in my blog for 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 years now that hey facebook and youtube is really easy to perpetuate false information and only now because of covid that's really come to the forefront so that's really harming our response to covid and it's really harming our uptake to the vaccine so i think that whenever someone writes something false about say the covid vaccine that can be shared on on facebook to people who who have the same worldview as you and that only perpetuates uh, misinformation so yeah uh, mm-hmm. no i mean and i hear you but you know what's interesting and maybe you this is i'm going to give share i know i'm interviewing you but i want to share this one little perspective because i've been in the vaccine world now you know our, our organization used to be called the vaccine center you know, so we do adult vaccination. We've been doing it for 10, you know, actually 20 years if you go back. And one of the interesting thing that vaccine and misinformation, there's a there's an interesting coupling that doesn't happen in other aspects of medicine. Like I don't, there's no Facebook group of moms against antibiotics for their children. Mm-hmm. There is no Facebook group of people who don't believe in migraine medicine or mm-hmm. whatever. So, you know, people always use, because I'm in the vaccine business, like, what is it about vaccines that all this misinformation and there's yeah. inertia? And the you know what we used to say even before COVID is because vaccines are a class of well, the biologics, but let's call them drugs, that uh, government forces you to take to get into school, you know, your kids, whatever it then is not viewed as that. Because I've never come, no one's ever come to me and say, hey, Dr. Bakhtari, I don't believe in antibiotics. Nobody even says that. Why? I mean, if if vaccines and antibiotics were just different categories, why isn't there a certain percentage of people who refuse to take antibiotics? It just doesn't, or why are there physicians that say, oh, I don't believe in antibiotics? No physician says that. 
So I think there's something inherent about vaccines in general before COVID. Yeah. And now this misinformation that you're talking about, I think is part of that story. Had you ever thought about it that way? And am I crazy for looking at it like that? Well, I think the reason why people have such a reaction against vaccines is because the benefits of vaccines are not immediately tangible. And that's the difference between vaccines and antibiotics. If you're sick with an infection and you take an antibiotics, you get tangibly, ah, you get tangibly better within 10 to 14 days in most cases. Right, right. But you take a vaccine, really the benefit of it is you not catching a disease, right? Right, So, right. And then sometimes some of the, the, the pur purported, um, you know, side effects of, of vaccines you know there's that false yeah. relationship between autism and vaccines like, of course i think that um people think that it's caused by vaccines but i think the reason why there's this such backlash against it is that the the benefits of it isn't immediately yeah tangible. But, but but i hear that by the way that's probably if, with that about but even if someone's on you know medications for crohn's diabetes mm -hmm. even medications that don't give you immediate benefit that doesn't have this visceral, yeah. like 30% of people say, I'm never taking that. You know, I don't think 30% of Crohn's patients say that, or yeah. even if it's not. So, but anyway, but it, the, and then just finishing up with this medical misinformation though. Uh, so I think the medical misinformation is hard because the people who are anti vaccine or whatever perpetuate these crazy, you know, things and then it develops a life of its own. So, how does, how do you get the because it's not all upside for vaccines either you got to talk about breakthrough cases mm -hmm. and so how do you get real information that may not be essentially call it not good news or whatever but still because i think people will latch on to that and you know you talk about breakthrough cases with covid ah you see the vaccine mm -hmm. doesn't work so but you still want to get that information out yeah. so how do you get out negative information potentially without you know, uh, having people seize on it and say, oh, well, uh, you see, I have mm -hmm. myocarditis, I, I knew it, and uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, so I, I find it difficult to get negative information out that should be, that is not missing, medical misinformation, but then people la latch onto it. Yeah. So I think one of the, you know, before I answer that, I think one of the things that um, we need to realize that whenever we're online, our job isn't necessarily to convince 100% of the people that you're talking to, especially online, right? Uh, because it's, we're so polarized right now. We live in such a polarized society that I think that if you go online expecting to convince everybody that you talk to, <laughs> that's not a realistic expectation. I always counsel physicians when they go online, there's always going to be a third of people who agree with everything that you say. There's a third of people who, no matter what you say, is going to disagree with what you say. Right. And then there's that third in the middle who are kind of persuadable to either side. And when I go online or when I advise physicians to go online, it's that middle third that you're really right. aiming to target. You want to convince a couple of people, you know, the more the better. But if you convince one or two people to give a mm -hmm. second thought about the vaccine or, or whatever is out mm -hmm. there, then, then I think that's a job well done. In terms of negative information or side effects, I think you just have to be truthful, right? So I think that a right. lot of it is a choice. So when I'm in the exam room talking to someone who is hesitant about the COVID vaccine, you can't lie about the connection to potential myocarditis or with um, thrombosis with the Johnson & Johnson AstraZeneca right. vaccine. You just have to be truthful and just right. let them know is that you have the risk and you give them the statistics and you weigh that against the potential right. of catching COVID and ending up in the hospital. And if you go to a hospital right. on a ventilator, your chances of getting out of the hospital is relatively low. So you right. eventually patients have to make their own decisions. You have to be honest with them with the numbers. You share what you would do in their situation. But I always like to give the ultimate decision to the patients. You know, right, I think that we talk about things like mandates and all that. And I think that absolutely should be a last resort. But in, in most cases, I'm able to at least get patients thinking, saying, hey, you know, I have a different perspective on, right. on the vaccine. And even though there are, are some right. rare, 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 rare side effects that I think right. that, hey, my doctor is saying that the chances of, of having some type of serious effects from COVID is actually a pretty high probability in relation to whatever rare side effects are the vaccine. And that at least it gets them thinking about taking it. Yeah, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. And I've gotten those emails thanking me that you know, their relative that wind up, you know, after watching something we did, wound up taking the vaccine. And that's all really gratifying. And I totally agree with you. Um, 
The one other interesting thing, and we can wrap it up with this idea, is you know one of the interesting things that I find for the, some of the, my patients or people I've talked to that are hesitant is they have a different bar for like the COVID vaccine than they do if they needed orthoscopic surgery. Nobody goes into orthoscopic surgery or a tonsillectomy and says, unless you can prove to me without a shadow of a doubt, there'll be no side effects. And until, you know, every study is published, that I basically, I want no risk, but, and then I'll take the COVID vaccine. I'm not saying everyone, just a subset. <laughs> but nobody says that when they're going to, nobody turns their orthopedist mm-hmm. right, as about to drape them and take them into the OR. And I just, I want to be very clear about this orthopedic surgery there's absolutely no risk that i'll have a reaction to anesthesia i won't get an infection because if that's the case my bar which i have for my covid vaccine is i'm not taking it until there's metaphysical uh, no metaphysical possibility i'll get a side effect and i think having one bar for your covid vaccine but walking into your doctor's office and taking an ulcer medicine or getting a procedure done for some people it's not the same bar Mm-hmm. And when you see that, does that stick out to you that they have a different bar yeah. for the COVID vaccine? I think what you said is absolutely true. And I also think it's, um, you know, what we talk about having an immediate gratification. You know, if you go into an orthopedic surgery and it fixes your knee that's been bothering you for 15 years, you know, I think that's a that's an immediate relief. Whereas, like like we said before, the vaccine doesn't have an immediate relief. So I think that also I wanted to add to that is, you know, with the vaccine's a needle, right? So it's a little bit more invasive than say a pill. So that's why I think that there was such an acceptance of people who are vaccine hesitant, but they were so willing to take hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin right. and all that. So I do think eventually when the Merck and Pfizer and right. um, you know anti-COVID antivirals come out, there are going to be more people who are willing to take that after they get diagnosed with COVID than they are uh, then they are willing to take a vaccine before they get COVID. So Which is, event- eventually, I think that once we have these antivirals approved and um, you know commonplace, hopefully early 2022, you are going to have more people take those um, after, similar to like a Tamiflu after they get diagnosed with right. the flu. Which is, you know, not ideal because, I mean, if, if at possible, prevention is better than yeah. therapy for, and, and trying to cure. So I hear that, then I hear that perspective. Um, so let's just sort of wrap it up with this so it's, how do you think covid the pandemic is going to change primary care healthcare will will we be looking in the rearview mirror in 10 years and saying you know it was really covid of course you know with telemedicine taking off mm-hmm. and all, i get mm-hmm. that part but w- is there any tangible change to the relationship you're having or healthcare will have with patients that will be impacted by covid the way you see it so I'm going to um, answer this in two ways. I think that, you know, to, to answer your question directly in terms of how is it going to change our relationship with patients. Um, you know, I think that, yeah, you talk about kind of virtual options and the importance of, um, I think that during COVID, a lot of patients didn't see me for like a year. So a lot of their cancer screenings and preventive medicine has been put off. And we're seeing the effects of that now with delayed diagnosis of cancer. And I think that hopefully it's going to have a force and appreciation of primary care for, uh, for a lot of patients and make them realize, Hey, I need to, you know, see my doctor because I haven't been able to see him for a year and, you know, my health deteriorated or I got a delayed diagnosis of something of diabetes and, and cancer. And I think that, you know, that would hopefully have more of an appreciation of, of what we do as primary care physicians. Um, you talk about things like virtual medicine, about how, care doesn't necessarily need to be um, face-to-face in the exam room. And and I think that there are a lot of things that we can do over the, um, you know, virtual screen or um, so I think that hopefully insurers um, uh, recognize that because I think that a lot of the payment mechanisms, they reward face-to-face care. They don't necessarily see the value of virtual care. So hopefully during this pandemic insurers and people who reimburse for, for visits realize that. Um, And then I'm also going to answer that from a physician perspective. I think that one of the things that a lot of doctors are realizing is that um, our jobs aren't as secure as we thought it was, right? You hear a lot of doctors who are laid off and uh, myself, I was partially furloughed during the pandemic because really, because the uh, clinic and hospital were shut down. And I've heard a lot of people who 
literally, you know, a lot of hospital systems are losing money because of COVID. So emergency physicians, they're getting, they're losing their jobs and getting laid off and replaced by advanced practice practitioners, for instance. So I think it's making a lot of doctors realize that medicine isn't necessarily the secure job they thought it was. And it makes them realize, like we talked about before, they shouldn't put all their proverbial eggs in, in one basket because not only is it taking a lot of, of, of your energy in life, but the rewards may not be there. Like you, you know, you could be working for a hospital system for 15 to 20 years. And if they're not making money or if they can replace you with someone cheaper, they will. And then right. I think COVID has made a lot of doctors realize that uh, medicine mm-hmm. isn't secure as it once was and making them realize that, Hey, we have to be more than our degrees. We need to realize that we, we, we can do things outside the exam room in the hospital. And I've talked to so many doctors on my podcast that, Um, Mm -hmm. where COVID was a wake-up call for them, where they had to realize that being 100% into clinical medicine, whether in the clinic or hospital or the operating room, um, wasn't the best choice for them. And I think that with the pandemic, it's making a lot of other physicians realize that. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So maybe what you were doing in 2004 is even more apropos for doctors to realize now whether you know starting their own platform or anything else you said to realize that they can't it's not in their best interest to be a a one act show uh they're going to have to come up with a second or third act uh hopefully in something related or interested in but the days of like you know finishing med school saying i'm now set economically and professionally i just need to you know, get in with the right group or start my own practice. I, I think those days are dead, especially when you add the insurance stuff, which we could, that would be a separate talk, but we'll leave that out for now. But anyway, so listen, I want to thank you so much. Uh, we really, I really enjoyed having a colleague, uh, especially such a leading thought leader. And I really appreciate it. If people want to get into contact with you, I know you have your website, any other places you recommend people to go uh, to learn more about everything, all the amazing thing you're doing. Just kevinmd.com and there's a way okay. to contact me there. And if you are interested in contributing an article, it doesn't have to be a clinician. I have a lot of patients who contribute their perspective on a healthcare system. They're um, always, I'm always willing to listen to what you guys have to say. And uh, it's important to ha- share perspectives both within medicine and outside of medicine as well. So kevinmd.com. Perfect. Dr. Poe, thank you so much for being here. We had an amazing time. Be well and thank you so much. Happy holidays. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Also, leave other topics that you'd like me to cover. Also, check out my website, bakhtarimd.com, and sign up for my newsletter and additional information about healthcare in general. And as usual, thank you and be well. Be well.